My name is Jorge Sobron. I am a professor at the University of Kansas and my task today is to give you a brief overview of some of the major uh, theoretical ideas in the world of ecological niche models. The first thing we need to ask is what is a theory and why do we need it? Uh, the way I'm going to use the word theory in this in this presentation is um, all the all the things I need to make the, the concepts formal. Formal means uh, with with established rigorous meanings and with ways to articulate one concept to another, uh, like mathematically or perhaps computationally. So I'm going to be talking about what are the assumptions of behind niche modeling, what are the definitions, and I will try to do the, that um, in a in a in a in an operational way, meaning that I will show how it is done using data. Uh, I'm going to describe a little bit the data that we will be using. What are the logical and mathematical relationships between different concepts? Uh, how do computations? And hopefully, if there is, if it is possible, show uh, some mathematical consequences of the above. And the point of doing this, you may ask, wh wh what do I need a theory for if I have an accent already and I know how to use it? Well, the thing is that there are different cases uh, that are logically different, and it's, uh, theory will help you to distinguish between different uh, types of problems that require different treatments. Uh, second thing is that um, you will be more capable of finding the scope for extrapolation or for transferring your results in time or in space. Uh, there's also um, theory will help you to understand what concepts are more important than others and also to interpret results rigorously and very importantly to communicate properly using a standardized language that allows for rigorous communication. Finally, theory highlights new avenues for research. For the purpose uh, that is the interest of people in this course, which is modeling uh, areas of distribution on the basis of uh, environmental constraints, uh, the, the main questions are what is an area of distribution? What do we mean by that? What is a niche? Again, what do we mean by a niche and what variables we use to define it? Um, how are these two things related? Are there relationships between different niches and different areas? Um, strengths and weaknesses of different schools. Uh, there, there are schools of, of distribution modeling and of niche modeling that emphasize the statistical approaches and there are others that emphasize processes. All these things I hope will be clarified uh, at the end of this talk. It may be important to appreciate that uh, the ideas and the theory uh, related to Nietzsche scenarios of distributions um, go back a long time. Uh, there are pioneers like von Humboldt and authors that are less well known like Good and Cairns. And of course, there are the classics, which are Grinnell, Hutchinson, Colwell, Maguire, that kind of people that wrote years ago papers that are still very well remembered and used. And there are the more recent um, persons working in this field, uh, like Mike Austin from Australia, Jackson and Overbeck, uh, Drake, Gotso, Bronyman, Blonder, Araujo, myself, Town Peterson. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, antecedents. And the first thing that I need to, to, to stress is that there are, there are dozens of definitions of niche. And in this talk, and basically in the entire course, we will be using one in particular, which is different from the one that most ecologists are familiar with. The definition we're going to use is niches are multivariate representations of the function of fitness of a species, meaning that different parts of environmental space produce different um, fitness values for a population experiencing that kind of thing. 
and I hope this is the right place to, to mention that I am going to be using just certain types of environmental variables, which are what Hutchinson calls sinopoetic variables, which are variables that are non-interactive. They change at their own rates and then tend to be they tend to be coarse grained. The best examples are climate and topography. And there are tons of these types of data, literally terabytes. Uh, basically, we will be using climate data and most uh, mostly obtained from, from WorldClim, which is um, a web page that uh, gives a lot of data, but there are many others and you can use uh, almost whatever you wish. Uh, uh, for, mo for several major countries in the world, those countries produce their own uh, layers of environmental data. So that's what we will be using. Not, I emphasize, not data related to competitors, to predators, uh, to resources that can be exhausted. One of the major ideas of Hutchinson was to realize that non-interactive variables were different from the others and non-interactive variables are the ones that we will be using in most of this course. The main theoretical ideas I will be discussing with you are Hutchinson's duality, uh, the fitness function, the difference between xenopoietic versus quote-unquote biotic variables, that there are different types of niche scenarios and how are they related in terms of a thing called Hutchinson's inequalities, and then finally the BAM diagram in its heuristic uh, um, form and, it, and some of its dynamic forms. I would like to mention that a lot of the ideas that we will be discussing were originally either fully proposed or just mentioned by George Evelyn Hutchinson in the in the photograph uh, and that includes the relationship between niches and distributions, the multidimensional niche space, the difference between fundamental realized and existing niches and the, disting the distinction between interactive versus non-interactive variables. All of those were mentioned by Hutchinson in one publication or another. It is often said that Hutchinson forgot about geography. Maybe, but he didn't forget about space. Um, he defined uh, the idea of a biotope that most people forgot. Biotopes are the correspond. If you have an, a point in each space, biotopes are the localities for for that correspond to those values of environment. This is an, an extremely important idea, and it's a pity that Hutchinson just gave it a few lines in the famous paper of um, the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium. This relationship between space and uh, niche and geographic space um, is a relationship that uh, has been um, given the name of Hutchinson's duality by, by Rob Colwell and Tiago Rangel. Uh, this is, and, and, and the core of the idea is, is very simple. You can do you can grid geographical space. Uh, you can also, there is also a, um, a version of what I'm going to say in continuous space, but in, in, in discrete space it's easier to understand. So grid geographic space, the way it is in the, in the graph there, uh, and calculate the environmental values of whatever variables you are interested in, in each one of the grids. That each one of the grids have a corresponding point in the graph called E space in three variables, uh, precipitation, annual precipitation, and the minimum and the maximum um, values of, of temperature in the year. So you see that for each point in the E space, there is a grid cell in the G space and the red highlighted uh, areas, which is the area of distribution of a squirrel, uh, can be highlighted both in G space and in E space. This idea of the Hutchinson's duality, it's truly one of the fundamental ideas behind uh, the world of ecologi ecological niche modeling or of species distribution modeling based on niche values. Uh, it's one of the two major ideas. Uh, and, and the reason is as follows. Uh, if you have enough precision 
and enough number of variables for each point in geographical space there is just one and only one point in environmental space so if you subset either geographic space or environmental space you get a subset in the corresponding space if you characterize a region in e like the way it is described in the graph with a little uh, red rectangle it maps into geographic space the way it, it is shown in the in the in the in the in the in the illustration now the thing is that this mapping is not simple at all it's actually very complicated the topology of the mapping is very complicated but the the the, the amount of mapping if you select 10 percent of environmental space you would be selecting 10 percent of geographic space if you select 80 percent of environmental space you would be selecting 80 percent of geographic space as long as you define geographic space in the gridded way i mentioned before and for each value of the grid you have a, a single point in environmental space this is a very important relationship so to to recapitulate uh, you grid a region of the of the map using a certain amount n of of little cells for each one you calculate the environmental values and as it is shown in the bottom uh, part of the figure uh, which is in two variables there is an, a histogram in two variables precipitation and temperature you can see which ones are more frequent in the world in which you are living and of course modeling in the areas which are infrequent environmentally is not the same thing as modeling in the areas which are very common uh, environmentally uh, i repeat if you do this with enough number of variables at enough precision you will get a one-to-one -one correspondence meaning a flat histogram with one cell per, 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 per environmental combination uh, this is uh, for to, in order to achieve this equality of, of of the number of of combinations in g and the number of combinations in e you need to have enough variables and at enough precision my experience shows that three or four variables uh, will give you um, mostly one-to-one -one, uh, relationships in most part of the world finally this means it should be pretty obvious that modeling distributions what is called sdm is not the same as modeling niches distributions live in the top part of the map and niches live in the bottom part of the map we will be coming back to this idea um, frequently during this talk so why you should care about this well uh, this is the basic property Hutchins, Hutchinson's duality is the is the basic property of geography it's a property of the world in which we live uh, that things are similar if you are close to to another point uh, it's uh, the property that shows that you can you can analyze uh, environments and get some idea of geography and vice versa without this feature it would be impossible to predict distributions on the basis of niches or calculate niches on the basis of distributions think about it the second major idea in ecological niche model a theoretical idea is that um, there is a function that goes from environmental space this multivariate uh, environmental space to fitness uh, that if you are in different regions uh, in environmental space the a population of a given species will have different fitness including negative fitness it would go extinct if you, the climate is not favorable so uh, since there is this function mapping from uh, this uh, complex red of uh, point uh, cloud of red points into fitness i can use that function to define different regions in in in, in the figure you see that there is a, a a bunch of blue points those are the ones with highest fitness uh, going uh, to lower and lower fitness towards the green and then the yellow side of the coloring and finally in the red parts fitness is negative so uh, 
this is this is an, a very important idea so important that we're going to have an entire talk uh, to talk to discuss this, this this point i am going to discuss this idea of the fitness function in great detail in another talk but right now what i am going to use this for is to tell you that you can use this fitness function to subdivide niche space in regions and these regions are the ones that Hutchinson subdivided in that famous paper of the 1957 the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Quantitative Biology. Uh, there are uh, two regions that um, Hutchinson uh, defined explicitly and another one that he just mentioned like in passing in one line. The first one clearly defined is the fundamental niche. The fundamental niche is a subset of all points in E that map to a positive fitness without interacting species. So it's a set of environmental conditions that would allow, allow a species, a population of a species to thrive, to, to have a growth rate either uh, higher than one if you are measuring it in, in a discrete model of um, uh, for example, a matrix transition model or a uh, uh, population growth rate higher than zero if you are using the intrinsic growth rate. So regions with positive growth rate are the fundamental, without interactors, the, that's the fundamental niche. The realized niche is that sub, the subset of that, of the fundamental, that remains when you introduce interacting species. For Hutchinson, these were competitors. And so if you introduce competitors, the idea of Hutchinson is that your, uh, the amount of niche space you are, that a population is using re is reduced. Finally, Hutchinson mentioned that there was also the possibility of regions inside the fundamental niche that wouldn't exist. There were no points in the biotope, as he called it. This is a very important idea, and now it is called by Peterson and Araujo and, and uh, Martin, uh, Martinez Meyer and Nakamura and Anderson. It's called the existing niche. So I'm going to make this more more graphic. Uh, go to the to the to the image in the right part of the slide and you'll see a cloud of points this is the climate of north america uh, and the uh, colored ellipsoids are models that represent the fundamental niches of four north american species i believe they are um, lagomorphs rabbits and hares uh, the red or rather the colored points in uh, large points are gpf uh, data points. So uh, the the ellipsoids that you see in the graph are fundamental niches, and every point that is contained by by each one of those ellipsoids uh, is part of the existing niche, and you will appreciate immediately that there may there there may be large regions in the ellipsoids with no points underneath, and that is because they're that combination of climate does not exist right now. Uh, finally, uh, the, the, the large points, the, the large uh, circles in color represent instances of the realized niche because the realized niche is, is the result of the fundamental expressed in a particular environmental cloud and where in, um, the, the interactors allow the species to persist. Competitors do not outcompete the species. Predators do not extinguish local populations, and so on. The above reasoning, based on the idea that uh, there is a function of fitness from 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 environmental space to fitness, allow uh, us to to have some some equation that that illustrates what belongs to what or what is contained on what. Uh, you see in that equation that we have a fundamental niche, which is N sub F, and that is what everybody would like to know. Uh, and that contains the existing niche. Those are the points inside the ellipsoids in the previous graph. And then that existing niche is further um, 
reduced either by movements, by in the incapacity to reach certain parts which are favorable but are out of reach to movements of the species, and it's also uh, re uh, restricted by interactions. Um, we we include all interaction, not just competition like like uh, like uh, uh, like Hutchinson. And the size of the existing niche, or with the one with the, with a little asterisk, equals the potential area that a species can occupy. Again, an extremely useful and interesting relationship. If you sub-select the points inside an ellipsoid in the graph uh, above, the number of points in the niche space equals the number of cells in the, in the, in the geographical grid that we, we established. I have called the uh, above inequalities Hutchinson's inequalities because, well, Hutchinson, although he didn't use symbols, he was the first to describe this uh, uh, structure of something being contained in something else. And their importance for the field of ecological niche modeling, for those of you that do make sense, is that they show that the fundamental niche, which is probably a simple shape, is distorted by the existing environmental conditions in a particular place at a particular time. Remember that the climate is changing, so the cloud of points is, is shifting, not necessarily so the ellipsoids. So every time that a point enters the ellipsoid, it becomes a favorable place for the species, and every time a point leaves the ellipsoid, goes outside the ellipsoid, that particular cell in the map becomes uh, not, by hypothesis, not suitable for the species. Uh, the second thing is that uh, this debate about complex forms uh, of uh, complex models becoming better models than simpler forms, uh, which is a debate in the literature, is totally moot. It depends on what are we aiming to model. Fundamental needs probably have simple forms and realized niches can have very complicated forms. Another thing is that uh, the Hutchinson's inequalities suggest the critical importance of estimating fundamental niches, something that should be done experimentally and is seldom done. Um, and they also suggest that the amount of inequality between the different types of niche describes either how much evolutionary space is left or how much area is left in the world that can be colonized by a, by a migratory population uh, from a suitable place into a previously unreached but suitable place. This is the area of invasive species modeling. Um, also, it, uh, it suggests that the potential area of distribution should be smaller than the actual area of distribution, something that is absolutely surprising how often it is forgotten in the literature. All the above is um, summarized in this, in this figure. Uh, you have an area of the world which is more or less parts of the Western Hemisphere, G, and uh, a corresponding uh, environmental space just in two dimensions in this particular example. You can use more dimensions. Then you have uh, a fundamental niche for that particular bug that you see there, and that was calculated experimentally. Uh, if you superimpose that little red ellipsoid inside on top of the of the of the of the graph uh, of the um, uh, environments existing in the region, using the same scales and the same variables, which is uh, at a tricky point, then you are in a way capturing a subset of points, and that subset of points in red is called the existing niche. And if you project that in geography, you see all the red points inside the M region and the A regions in the map. That is a mapping of the points inside the environmental cloud into geography. And those are the areas of distribution that you get, assuming that you also have, say, for instance, competitors that would reduce the amount of data in uh, the amount of points in red to just those points in blue. Well, 
where you that's where you find the the, the, the area of distribution that is uh, the actually occupied area niche models don't model in general occupied areas they model potential areas so the total amount of points that are inside the geographic uh, the fundamental niche this is something that requires a lot of explaining and there are many caveats i'm not going to get into that but simply notice that there are three types of niches and three types of areas when you apply accent or any other algorithm you should be able what to, to say exactly what are you trying to model because it's not the same to try to model a the area a than to try to model the area g o another a bit arcane uh, area of interest in in the theory of of niches is what shape is the fundamental niche hutchinson assumed that they, they were rectangles or squares hyper rectangles or hyper squares in in many dimensions uh, soon people said now well not squares probably ellipsoids like maguire and austin drake uh, jim brown or maybe a convex hole, which is something that is done more recently. The reason for the convexity is simple. It is assumed that if fitness is positive at the extremes of an environmental range, it should be positive also at an intermediate value. Uh, this is a very nice and reasonable hypothesis, but needs to be tested empirically. A very important question is how do we measure the fundamental niches? Fundamental niches are not in general estimated by niche modeling, much that we wish it to be the case. So the, the, the actual rigorous, um, strict way of estimating fundamental niches is by performing experiments on the species. If the, the species are animals, these are kind of cruel. Uh, that may help to explain why there is so little data. So you would be raising the temperature uh, until your animals are dying or reducing the temperature, assuming that there are plants until they start dying and so on. And the uh, little available data that I have been able to find basically uh, is quite compatible with the, with the idea of convexity. Uh, mostly in one or two dimensions because um, there are no experiments in three dimensions. Finally, I would like you to remember something which is should be extremely obvious. It's been obvious since forever that the area of distribution of a species is not just the result of climate. So it cannot be predicted just using ecological niche modeling you need to know more things for instance what are the biotic interactors what are the predators what are the competitors uh, what are the the dispersers the mutualists and so on unless the biotic environment is as suitable as the abiotic environment the species wouldn't be there and finally and this is tremendously important among other things because it is easy to, well reasonably easy to model is that you need to know if your species has been able to move to every what parts the species have been able to reach and in some way test to see if the a and b circles are favorable uh, for instance uh, maybe Perhaps there are perfectly suitable areas for Siberian tigers across the Bering Strait in Canada and in Alaska, but you don't see Siberian tigers over there, probably because they have not been able to move. And that's uh, the M circle there. So unless the three circles intersect, you don't get an area of distribution, it's an occupied area of distribution. You may get a potential area of distribution in the intersection of a and B, but it's not going to be occupied unless M also is part of that. And the idea of M movements presupposes the idea of where from. Uh, um, so if you are going to model M, you need to have a hypothesis about where uh, population started uh, spreading from. 
<clears throat> the above diagram called the BAM diagram it's essentially a heuristic uh, tool is something that helps you to like visualize factors but it can be made uh, more formal and, and there are ways of making it dynamic I'm showing in that this horrible uh, slide three ways of making it more dynamic one is by climate forcing you can you can allow climate change and allow the different regions where the species is present to change depending on whether the climate is suitable or unsuitable. That's easy to do. That's climate forcing. Uh, you can also try to do basic population dynamics, modeling the um, the growth rate of a particular species in a particular cell on the basis of climate, but also what interactions are there, what resources are present, and also the, the, the movement. This is a metapopulation kind of model. It can be done, uh, but um, it is extremely computationally demanding. Finally, you can do coarse grain cellular automatons, where you just ask whether a particular cell in the map is occupied or not occupied. So values of zero or one uh, as uh, contrasted with the previous equation where you get uh, population densities, a continuous number. So uh, the, the last equation, the cellular automaton, basically requires a matrix which describes movements and a matrix that describes niches. In this particular equation, I forgot to add the matrix that describes interactions. All the three can be um, actually uh, um, modeled with real data and computationally, uh, although computationally intensive, it, it, it is feasible to do it. This is an example that I hope it will work. Uh, there should be an animation of the, of the how can you model in a dynamic way the 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 spread of a population of in particular case of this bird it began in florida the blue uh, crosses are the points which are suitable just by niche modeling but if you allow it to proceed for long enough you will see how it begins spreading from florida first very slowly and eventually to cover the entire blue region it is going to do it through a very unexpected path and this is the sort of thing that you don't see unless you do the dynamical modeling uh, i hope the simulation is working now oh, and by the way the cloud of black points to the right uh, bottom side of the slide <coughs> is the are the climatic combinations of the old world where the model was fitted and you see in, in red and blue the niche model uh, of this species in the old world and it was then transferred to the new world. Well, to conclude this talk, which has been pretty dense and I didn't cover everything, um, I would like to stress uh, several things for you. Uh, by adding theory to the practice of niche modeling, one gains several things. First, conceptual clarity. There are several things that are uh, highlighted by uh, thinking in a formal way about what we are doing. The first thing, for instance, is that ecological niche modeling is not the same as the spe species distribution modeling. One takes place in a conceptual abstract environmental space, the other takes place in geography. Or, for instance, the convenience of distinguishing different types of niches and being explicit about what one is trying to model. That, that may be make acceptable to use simple quote unquote algorithms or the, the need to use quote unquote complex algorithms. And that's the third point in my, in my list. Um, also by, by doing theory, we were made aware of the need to distinguish 
different types of distributional areas and again what ecological niche model estimates which are things closer to the potential area of distributions rather than to the actual uh, occupied distribution of a species uh, most important this hypothesis about mechanisms enable us to move forward from purely statistical and correlative um, and static methodologies to process oriented dynamic modeling um, somebody said that there is nothing more practical than a good theory and i quite agree with that